So today we are looking at water worlds, places that consist entirely of water on their surface with no land at all. We will be discussing how they might still have land life in spite of that, how life might evolve there, and how we might terraform such a planet ourselves. Now it has been a while since we were in the Habitable Planet series, we have been off covering a lot of other topics, many interconnected, so it will be a nice break to talk about a subject that is a lot more down to earth, at least as much as discussing an alien world could be considered down to earth, though by the standards of this channel this subject is about as close as we come to that. If you're new to this channel, I will occasionally reference associated topics we've covered in more detail elsewhere, and you often see a video link pop up you can click on to pause this video and watch that one in a new window. Also, if you haven't gotten used to my voice yet, it's a good idea to turn on the closed caption subtitles on the video. We tend to move through a lot of info quickly, so anything that makes it easier for you to understand me is a good idea. On that note, if you are a veteran to this channel, I should add that we will be going at a slower pace for this video. I think I've been slamming through material a little too quickly in recent ones, and I felt like we should take our time for this trip. Whenever we look at these planets in this series, we have certain goals we aim to achieve and questions that need answering, and I thought I'd list them out formally this time. These are, number one, what are the specific traits of these planets? Number two, are there any important subcategories? Number three, how likely or uncommon are such planets? Number four, how likely is life on them? Number five, how likely is complex or intelligent life? And number six, how would we terraform such a planet? Now most of the time in this series, I'd ask if we could terraform a given type of planet, but if you are a regular to this channel, you know the answer was always yes. In fact, last week we were talking about basically terraforming black holes, so I'm not even going to bother answering if we can terraform a planet covered in water. Just talk about some of the options unique to oceanic planets. Ditto, on a planet covered in liquid water, which is our main trait used to find the habitable zone of a solar system, if liquid water can exist there, it would seem a bit pointless to ask if life can emerge on such planets. We'll instead look at how in some cases it might not, and some challenges some types of oceanic planets might face for complex life to emerge. So let's start with number one, what are the specific traits of these planets? what makes a planet an ocean world, and what the features might we expect. Well, the simple answer is it is a planet almost completely covered in water, though it might have some small land masses and ice at the poles. And today we are not interested in a world that's totally covered in ice, though we will be talking about ice quite a lot, even on ones with none on the surface, because there's a lot of different types of ice, and some can exist at room temperature, or even temperatures that would normally boil water. More on that in a bit. Today I am defining this broad category of planets into those which contain little or no land, at least in the sense of land being rocks and dirt left over from volcanic eruptions and tectonic upheaval above the sea level. And it is tricky for us to predict how common that actually is on planets because we don't know what drives all tectonic plates, or what the prime driving force for them is. There's many theories, that it's convection in the mantle over them, or that ore plates get denser and sink being two of the most popular currently and we don't know how much tidal forces of moon or sun play a role in this. Stacked against that, we know the sun and moon both play a huge role in erosion of land, waves crashing onto rocks, tides lowering and raising the sea level, storms, rain, wind, etc. all act to erode rocky land masses, and in a world with no tectonic activity they'd eventually wear down the landscape, and if they were stronger they'd do it faster. A world with very little tectonics and a great deal of erosive forces could easily become one in which there was no land even if the seas weren't very deep. Similarly, if your oceans are a lot deeper, it's much harder for land to emerge up through all that extra water, and water is very common in the universe because hydrogen and oxygen are the first and third most abundant elements. Earth is just under a third each iron and oxygen with the remaining third being mostly silicon and magnesium, but oxygen is much more common in the crust and iron in the core. The rock and dirt you walk on, the water you drink and swim in, is mostly oxygen because oxygen is so common in the universe. Yet hydrogen and helium are much more common in the universe and nearly absent from Earth, and oxygen is a lot less common on the planet Mercury for instance. We've talked about this before and it comes down to three big factors. 
The sun tends to handle plants with ionizing radiation that strips off lighter elements, especially helium which can't chemically bond to anything to form heavier molecules and solids. Retaining lighter elements then comes down to these three things. Number 1. How massive or dense a planet is. Increasing these increases the escape velocity of the planet and those particles trying to flee it. Number 2. How strong its magnetosphere is, since that will help keep back some of the radiation stripping the particles and can bounce many fleeing ones back down. And number 3. How hot the planet is, since that indicates both how much radiation it is being exposed to and what the overall temperature is. Temperature provides a large initial boost to each particle's speed, especially lighter elements, that makes them easier to whack with radiation and add enough speed to lift them off the planet. We've talked about that in more detail in the terraforming video. What it means in a nutshell is that planets much lighter than Earth generally won't have true atmospheres and so can't have liquid water either. Water just doesn't exist as a liquid below 600 pascals, or 6 millibars of pressure, about 0.6% of Earth's sea level air pressure, and even above that there's a much lower range of temperatures that permit liquid water to exist than we're used to. There's an experiment we often do in introductory physics courses where we stick a cup of water at room temperature under a jar and pump air out until it boils. Pressure is always pushing on water molecules trying to stick them together while temperature pushes them outward trying to force them apart. Liquids basically exist in that range where neither is winning the fight. When pressure wins and dominates the situation, you generally get a solid, and when temperature wins you get a gas. That pressure and temperature vary by each substance, and you can get many different types of solids with substances, including normal old water ice. That will be important in a bit too. Now pressure is a factor of only how strong your gravity is at a given spot and how much stuff is sitting on top of it. You've got roughly 14 pounds of air sitting over every square inch of your head for instance, 14 psi, or around 10 tons on every square meter. 10,000 kilograms, or about 100,000 pascals, or 100 kilopascals, or 0.1 megapascals. You'd also know this is a bar of pressure, a bar being exactly 100 kilopascals, or 0.1 megapascals, or an atmosphere of pressure. It's actually a bit more at sea level, an atmosphere is 1.01 bars. Up here in Ohio, where I live, it's usually a bit less than that, about 0.98 bars, or 0.97 atmospheres. These can get confusing sometimes, because while the one is calibrated off sea level, the other is in metric and just coincidentally, they are very close to each other. In case you're wondering, Mars' atmosphere at the surface is 6 millibars, which as I mentioned is the point where liquid water ceases becoming possible at any temperature, so it wouldn't take much more air to allow liquid water on Mars. So lighter planets have a problem holding on to air and water. Alternatively, heavier plants can hold onto it much easier, so we'd actually expect, all things being equal, that planets bigger than Earth would have more water on them proportionally, but they also have less surface area to spread that around. If I keep the density the same and just double a planet's mass, I'd only increase its radius by about 26% and its surface area by 59%, yet it would have double the water even if it only had the same percentage of mass made of water so the water would be 26% deeper on average. Like I said though, you'd expect if Earth were more massive, it would have more water proportionally too, because much less of its hydrogen would escape, so its oceans could be even deeper. I mentioned this in regard to the Fermi Paradox, the question of where all the aliens are, as an example of how a planet might be uninhabitable, at least to technological life, from even a minor change to Earth's mass since we might have no liquid water if we were just a bit less massive, and so much water there'd be no land if we were a bit more massive. We're not really sure yet where that critical point comes in though, since planetary modeling is still pretty new and hasn't got tons of real world data from exoplanets to plug in to check that, but the indications so far are that worlds significantly more massive than Earth and similar in temperature will have more water and that plants significantly less massive will either be icy of cold or lack much ocean, maybe any at all. So even though the main trait of a water world is simply having a lot of water, we are seeing a second related trait that they probably tend to be massive. Don't confuse this with ice covered planets or moons like Europa where under the ice there's liquid water, 
different topic for a different day. That's our third trait though. They need to be warm enough to have liquid water with only air and space between that water and the sun, which also puts photosynthesis on the table. More on that later. So let's move on to our second topic for today, subcategories of these planets. This is mostly about depth of water. There's really no official names for these yet, and the two subcategories created at Orion's own, a site those of you who are regulars here know I like to reference a lot, doesn't satisfy me in this case as a good system. There they use bathypelagic and panthalassic to afford a water worlds where the oceans are less than 50 kilometers deep or 30 miles for the former and more for the latter. This is non-ideal because it's not describing them in anything but an arbitrary depth, though that break isn't entirely arbitrary. 30 miles is twice as high as the tallest mountain in our solar system, Olympus Mons on Mars, where there is no significant erosion to shorten it and less gravity to prevent it getting higher. So we can safely assume land masses arising from an ocean floor will very rarely get that high and thus couldn't be dry land, just underwater mountains. But as I said, this doesn't satisfy because we have more variables in mind. So let's create four planets based on water depth and erosive and tectonic net effects. Now, thalassic and pelagic both mean water or sea in Old Greek, but pelagic is what we use for defining oceanic zones here on Earth, so I will stick with that. Personally, I prefer to consider them all panthalassic, but that's because I can't pronounce worlds, and panthalassic planets suits me better than water worlds. It's also Greek, pan, all, thalassic, sea, and you're supposed to use Greek or Latin for this stuff or people might not think you're doing science. Plus, I hated that film, Waterworld in spite of being a big fan of Kevin Costner as an actor and a director. A couple years later he did that film The Postman, adapted from the book of the same name, by eminent author and physicist David Brin, and I think it's a pity he didn't do them backwards since he could have consulted Brin about water worlds, something he discussed in his Uplift series at one point. Of course he'd probably have told Costner that if you melted every drop of ice in our poles, you'd still have a ton of land left over and scuttled the project or just been ignored, but I'm digressing again. So panthalassic planets will be the type name, and we will use pelagic for our subtypes. Now the pelagic zones we use are a bit arbitrary for lower ones, so we'll be lumping them together and taking some liberties with them, along with creating a new one, stereopelagic. Here are my four. Number one, epipelagic planets. Planets where only a thin skin of water covers the planet, but covers it basically everywhere. Such planets would only exist where erosive forces seriously beat out tectonic forces creating land. I am including the mesopelagic zone in these, but basically they would be planets where if you couldn't hold your breath and swim to the bottom in most places, you could scuba your way down. Epi means oval in Greek, and we're thinking of it like epidermis, your top layer of skin. Mesopelagic, meso, simply means middle, like mesolithic means middle stone age. Number 2. Bathypelagic. Planets where the ocean depths are more comparable to the norm on Earth. Erosive forces dominate tectonics enough that you don't get land masses, except maybe the occasional small island. These would be places where the ocean is miles deep almost everywhere, potentially even deeper than the deepest trenches on Earth. Bathypelagic means deep sea. Number 3. Abyssopelagic. On Earth, this is the next layer after bathypelagic, but you still have one more, hadopelagic, reference Hades, that is pretty arbitrary and mostly just applies to ocean trenches. Abyss meaning endless in Greek, while on Earth this begins just 4 kilometers down, we will be assuming it begins deeper today. Abyssopelagic planets for today will assume any planet, where even strong tectonic forces simply aren't enough to cause land to rise up through all that water. We can't put an actual depth to that, since not only would it vary from planet to planet, but we don't have the science for it just yet. As I mentioned, we don't actually know what drives tectonic forces for sure. For today it is a planet where even strong tectonics can't hoist land up over all that water, but there is actually land down there eventually. Now you might say, well, no duh, every planet would have land eventually, but not quite, and that gives us our fourth category. Number four, stereopelagic. Stereo actually means solid in Greek, so solid ocean would be the meaning here. As we'll see in a bit, under enough pressure, even at high temperatures, water can become ice, and ice denser than normal water so it wouldn't float up. Not only is the water too deep to possibly allow any surface land, but there's not even land at the bottom of the sea, 
just a thick layer of ice. In case you're curious, the use of stereo to describe sound emerged in the 1920s term stereophonics, literally solid sound, which might be regarded as a bit of a marketing made-up word for better sound quality. It's an interesting mutation because we mostly know stereo from the sound device for giving you a left and right ear sound, or the word stereotype, which itself is a mutation off of the original stereotype, which meant printing with a solid plate of type rather than the movable type printing presses, and its modern form associated to bigotry is also from the 1920s. Stereoscopic images at least influences the word stereophonic, since those involve producing an image which seemed more solid when viewed by using two separate images to give a 3D effect, one which was more solid as it were, and was very popular in the 19th century. Here we are using it very literally, stereoplagic, solid ocean, as our deepest panthalassic planet type, oceans which might go a hundred miles or more deep, and above that, abyssopelagic planets, for ones of seeming endless depth until many miles down you hit land. Above that, bathypelagic planets, where the oceans are as deep or decently deeper than on Earth, and the lack of land is simply due to a mix of depth and greater erosive forces. And finally, our shallowest, epipelagic, where the ocean is not very deep at all, no more than most lakes, and these can exist only because of very weak tectonics mixed with powerful erosion. That erosion, incidentally, need not be entirely natural, in this sense, possibly being a byproduct of life itself. We'll talk about these in detail now, but we'll be adding in our third, fourth, and fifth topics as we go through each individually, and summarize those at the end of our look at the four subtypes. Those again were how common or likely such a planet is, how likely life would be on them, and how likely it would be for complex or intelligent life to show up on them. So let's talk about these in a bit more detail, back down in order of depth. An epipelagic planet is a very shallow one. These probably wouldn't be terribly common because it's not very likely a planet could have so little tectonics as to keep a planet nearly smooth and still have water and air. After all, even the occasional large asteroid strike ought to spoil that smoothness. But they wouldn't be so rare as the double planets and Roche worlds we discussed last time either. As I mentioned, I wrapped in the mesopelagic zone to this planet type too. On Earth, the epipelagic zone, also known as the photic zone, is the first 200 meters or 660 feet of water, where photosynthesis is actually possible. This will be the case on most other planets too, though those with thicker atmospheres won't get as much light through, and it might be decently less there. It wouldn't be much more though because a planet that received more illumination, that could penetrate deeper, would also be much hotter. The mesopelagic, which extends beneath that to about a kilometer depth, is too deep for photosynthesis, but still light enough for vision to be useful. Virtually all marine life lives in those two zones, and it is the epipelagic that is the main food pump for marine life. Now the reason this is an important subtype is because there is no problem at all with getting nutrients and minerals to the area where photosynthesis can take place. That is a big issue with the other three types. On our epipelagic planets, water currents can easily transport stuff from the seafloor up to the light heavy regions for plants to use, and it would be possible for plants to grow like trees from the bottom all the way to the top, although that would be trickier for plants who were growing in areas where the light didn't get all the way down to the seafloor strong enough to allow photosynthesis. But the epipelagic does go down 660 feet, deeper than the tallest redwood trees are high, and there is seaweed that has been measured nearly 200 meters tall too. So you could get some very tall marine flora, and such worlds actually ought to be hyperabundant in life. On Earth, outside of the shallow regions, the ocean tends to be low on life, even in the photic zone, because there just isn't much nutrients available, and plants have had to adapt to be able to even just get that. Where the ocean is shallower, closer to the shore, Life is much more abundant because nutrients are readily available to plants by either being directly accessible or easily kicked up by tides and currents to that height. So that is our definition for an epipelagic planet, one which weirdly has no land above water but is still close enough to the seafloor that plants can either directly reach it and sunlight, or that currents drive nutrients up regularly, which if there is a lot of erosive forces would presumably be easier too. You would expect life, if it arises, to be super abundant compared even to Earth. An epipelagic planet should be a giant biomass pump. Now you would think life would be very likely to arise on such worlds, but that's not a given. 
We have three probable causes for the origin of life, in a modern scientific context anyway. Tidal pools, oceanic thermal events, and panspermia. Now panspermia, the notion that the simple precursors for life, or even very simple life, might have rained down on Earth isn't in great favor, and often attracts some mystic woo and pseudoscience elements, but it remains a decent theory for abiogenesis, and obviously would work as well on this planet as any other, so no problem. Tidal pools wouldn't actually exist on a landless planet, but reasonable approximations of that same effect, essentially making a nice solution of mud, would be quite abundant. Thermal events less so, since we have said these planets would exist primarily because tectonic forces, giving rise to volcanic activity, wouldn't be strong, and so you wouldn't expect as many thermal events, though that's hard to say for sure. Last I checked, that was the preferred theory for the origin of life over tidal pools, and both are normally considered vastly more likely than panspermia, so these worlds could remain barren lifeless mud balls. I don't think it's a stretch to assume they would have life, and complex life would have no serious barriers to existence either after that, including intelligence. But you can't have fire on panthlastic planets, because everything is either underwater or constantly drenched. Now to get around that, first we could assume plants form dry areas, either treetops, as it were, extending above the water, or actual rafts. It isn't inconceivable you might get some analog to dry land on some of these. Ditto, you could get ice at the poles and icebergs drifting south and maybe things would live on those, even if just as a place to hang out the fish from. But even in that scenario, they would have to carry their rock up from the seabed manually, and I can't see them ever developing metal. A scenario for technological civilizations arising from a world like this, or any of our panthlastic planet types, probably does exist, but it would seem very contrived and improbable. Alternatively, once technology did exist, it would be easy enough to maintain so it would be no issue for a civilization to set up shop on such a planet that arose elsewhere. So ignoring that these planets probably aren't too common, though probably not incredibly rare either, and also the possible thermal vent issue for letting life begin there in the first place, epipelagic planets are ideal for life, better than Earth probably at least for pumping out raw quantity, but not for creating technological civilizations. Bathypelagic worlds would be a bit harder on life. These plants are likely a lot more common than epipelagic, but the depth of the ocean makes transport of nutrients up to the photic zone quite tricky, especially since we've already stipulated that most of these probably have oceans deeper than our own bathypelagic zone on Earth usually ends at, or much less tectonic activity, otherwise they'd have land. You could get life around the thermal vents, but unless they were at least some islands or lots of spots where the land rose nearly to the surface, it would be hard to get much nutrient up to the photic zone. I already mentioned that those parts of our own ocean that go that deep tend to be fairly barren, even up in their photic zone, from a lack of nutrients, but it's actually a bit worse here because we still have plenty of land sweeping nutrients out of the ocean before they sink too deep. So bathypelagic planets could certainly have life deep down near thermal vents, but that's not very nourishing at a planetary scale, and they'd have a tough time getting anything going up in the photic zone. Indeed, the main source for energy for life in our own bathypelagic zone is marine snow, a term for the constantly falling, snow-like appearing detritus of flora and fauna in the upper zones. I think you'd almost need a reverse snow, dead matter and nutrient carrying itself upward, to get this to work, but you need some sort of pump putting nutrients up where the sun could reach, or a ton of thermal vent activity, which would seem to counterindicate not having any land masses. So these planets would probably have life, but it wouldn't likely get very abundant, and that would make long food chains to support large animals in large quantity tricky, so intelligent life would seem unlikely. It has even more of a problem developing technology than the epipelagic planets if intelligence did arise, though. A bathypelagic planet would probably need to have a lot of just barely submerged mountains, or many tiny islands to still qualify as a panthlastic planet, yet get the nutrients needed. If it had a lot of islands or atolls to permit genuinely abundant life, you might regard that subtype as an archipelago planet. Archipelago, or maybe for consistency, archipelagic, since it does have pelagos in there, though archipelago translates as chief sea, and if you're wondering what chief sea means that would make it now mean a chain of islands, that was very literal originally. The Aegean Sea southeast of Greece was called archipelago, chief sea, in a bit of an understandable egocentrism. It also happens to be filled to the brim with tiny islands. 
The word mutated a lot over the years, and into modern Italian when it came to mean any place studded with islands. You'd expect these just as much on an epipelagic planet too, but they aren't necessary for abundant life there while they are on a bathypelagic planet. They probably do deserve their own subcategory, since they straddle both and are also likely to be a bit different. The Galapagos Islands, also known as the Archipelago de Colon, gets the latter name from Christopher Columbus, who is Colombo in Portuguese and Colon in Spanish. The other name, Galapagos, means saddle in Spanish but is actually for the giant tortoises they found there whose shells resembled saddles. I mention this because the Galapagos Islands are best known as the place where Charles Darwin did a lot of his work, and because those tortoises, as well as Mockingbird's resident there, differed from island to island and helped him get the notion of evolution and origin of species put together. That's important today not just as a nod to Darwin, but as a reminder that little tiny islands can cause lots of biodiversity as you get small, isolated populations inbreeding together, passing mutations quite quickly. Meaning two little islands originally connected but having been separated even just a few thousand years before by the sinking of connecting bridge, could have a serious large difference in the two subspecies of each animal and plant that remained on each island. This could cause a lot of biodiversity, aiding advanced life developing and since there is land, there are plausible candidates for technological civilization to arise from. I should also note that you can get the same effect with submerged islands in proximity to each other, since you'd expect life to be abundant there, but minimal interchange between less mobile plants and animals who could not migrate, or rarely migrated, between the two. Our next type, abyssopelagic planets, is actually a very bad candidate for life, but a great one for terraforming. Here the oceans are simply so deep that even if the planet is very tectonically active, it just can't thrust mountains up the surface, and nutrients have no way to get up there, especially not in sufficient quantity for life. Now let me add three caveats to that. First, I should note that most of Earth's water isn't even in our oceans. For a long time, especially since we believe the formation of our moon involved the Earth being whacked by another planet that tore up our crust, and any water residing on the planet then, we assumed our oceans came from comets. Just in the last few years, we found huge amounts of water hundreds of miles below the surface, mostly locked up in a mineral called ringwoodite. This puts some serious doubts on a lot of our planetary modeling in terms of where water comes from here on Earth and on other planets, since it means water can be far below the crust and in immense quantities. So abyssopelagic planets might be less common than we might expect, since water, if abundant, might tend to get migrated down and cycle to and from like continents are with our mantle. However, we could still easily have planets with oceans too deep to allow land formation, so it likely just means abyssopelagic planets wouldn't be as common as we might first think. Second, even though it might turn out comets aren't where Earth got most of its water, it is where it got some. Also, while Saturn has very impressive rings these days, it hasn't always had them, and odds are good that Earth has had a nice set from time to time too. Planets often have rings. They vary in how big they are since they dwindle over time, either falling down or clumping into moons, and get replenished by collisions and the like. Earth doesn't get a lot of meteor damage because Jupiter protects us by sucking up most asteroids, but not all solar systems will have that arrangement so an abyssopelagic planet might get its nutrients from a fairly steady rain of dust. As is, Earth gets about 60 tons of space dust every day, stuff burning up in our atmosphere and floating down, or just random dust floating about we sweep up. There's probably been times that was a lot higher and some planets, especially higher mass ones, probably could get a lot more. And as mentioned, higher mass planets could be more likely to be covered in deep water to begin with. So caveat 2, abyssopelagic planets might get decently fed nutrients in their own photic zone to feed some plants. Of course how they migrated all the way up from the deep under the ocean if that's where life originated would be another story. Caveat 3 is the end, or beginning of that story, because these planets could have a lot of volcanic activity and thus thermal vents way way down at the bottom, so if that is where life originates they shouldn't have any special problem originating there either. Those caveats aside, the story doesn't look great for abyssopelagic planets to host complex life with a chance for technology. Thermal vents just don't provide a great overall power source to allow robust ecosystems that could support hundreds of animals of the same species, big enough to have human level intelligence, and close enough in proximity to form civilizations. They obviously can't have fire or metalworking either. But ironically, this makes these places perfect for humans. 
it is a possible exception to the norm where we might actually be able to set up our own biosphere on an alien planet without necessarily damaging the local life and maybe even helping it. Now the terraforming on such a planet would take two principal forms. The first would be building floating habitats for ourselves. If you are not a regular on this channel, the idea of building chains of floating islands, or even whole continents on top of a huge ocean, might seem pretty impressive, but compared to the efforts involved in interstellar colonization, or some of the mega structures we've looked at, even the modest ones, you'll recognize that building thousands of artificial islands is not exactly a major effort compared to those involved in getting there in the first place. You could source the matter from asteroids or from deep under the sea. You'd probably start with the former and convert over to deep ocean mining once you had some in place. Now building an undersea dome 10 or more miles underwater is one heck of a task, and there is no native light that deep to give you anything to look at, so a dome that deep is more for aesthetics if you decide to light up your immediate area. For every 10 meters you go down in the water, you add one atmosphere or bar to the pressure, more on higher gravity worlds. At 10 kilometers deep, that's a thousand atmospheres, double the depth, double the pressure. It's still a lot less than you need to make diamonds, or that they could withstand, so diamond domes deep under the sea would be plausible. Diamonds actually quite easy to make synthetically using microwave ovens. I wouldn't suggest trying to use your home microwave oven to save on getting your significant other a ring, but I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing diamond used in construction in the not too distant future, and the Air Force has been looking at making cockpit windows out of it, a nice research project that emerged at my old stomping grounds of Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where I interned before my senior year as an undergraduate back when I was 19. Great base, and there's a wonderful air and space museum there, should you ever be in the area. I seem to be big on digressions this time, probably as a result of going for a slower pace. Anyway, you could have your floating islands and native Earth marine life up top, and while you would expect marine snow to drift down to the native biology if there was any, there would be a decent chance to do this in a way that made it only food and not an invasive species. This would be harder around the domes if you decide to transplant life that could live off photosynthesis and lit the area outside up so you could see outside. You would need exterior lighting too. A light down on the seafloor would shine outside, but you wouldn't see anything for the same reason you can't see well outside through a window at night when you have the lights on, or see inside someone's windows from outside if it's daytime and they don't have lights on. This brings up one of my favorite concepts for terraforming I've nicknamed vertical reefs, because you can hang chains of lights off the bottoms of your floating islands to help vegetation grow far deeper than the normal photic zone of the oceans. And you could do the same for your dome below, as towers or roads of light, or drifting out like tentacles from submarine cities floating a mile underwater nowhere near land or the sea surface. This takes a lot of power, but is pretty doable on the power scales available to species that do interstellar travel, and we've talked about similar concepts in the Rogue Planets video a couple episodes back in this series, and the Arcology and Euclidopolis videos a couple weeks back on the channel. What's interesting is that if the planet had native life, so long as you limited yourself to bringing in species that relied on light or forced in secondhand byproducts of it to live, you could get away with not overlapping those two ecologies. And it is possible the waste from all that would generate a marine snow that might actually serve to help feed the native life, letting it grow in quantity and spread out from thermal events it was otherwise limited to exist near. Now our next and last category is a quick one except for the chemistry. Stereopelagic planets, ones with solid water, would be places where the ocean was so deep the pressure got high enough to turn water solid. Ice, normal water ice we are used to, is only one of many types of ice that can exist, and some at temperatures so high that it's maybe more accurate to think of them as a solid crystallized water than ice. The others happen at high pressures, those in the hundreds of megapascals range, or thousands of atmospheres. And again, under Earth gravity, it takes about 10 meters of water to get another atmosphere of pressure, or 100 to get a megapascal. A kilometer will get you 10 megapascals. 10 kilometers are 100, and weirder stuff happens at the hundreds. In between 2 and 600 megapascals, or 20 to 60 kilometers deep, weird types of ice can form at cold but not super cold temperatures. Over 600 megapascals, you get ice 6 forming at about the normal freezing temperature of water, 
and up past that pressure, it can start forming at room temperature or even near boiling temperature when up over 1000 megapascals. At depths in excess of 1000 kilometers, it transitions into ice 7. Normally, while we say ocean depths are quite cold, they never get too cold because if ice forms, it just drifts up toward the surface till it melts. Normal ice is less dense than water, which is why ice cubes and ice bulks float. Not so for ice 6 or ice 7. Ice 6 is about 30% denser than water, and both ice 7 and 8 are closer to 70% denser. They both sink in water, but that's still lighter than most stone especially the denser kinds that get made under massive pressures. So stereopelagic planets literally have a sea bottom composed not of rock, but solid water. We already had a difficult task of transporting nutrients from the seafloor of bathypelagic planets, and a seemingly impossible one for abyssopelagic planets. But on stereopelagic planets, there would not even be a seafloor made of rock, just solid water. These could only be terraformed by either doing floating islands with mass brought in from elsewhere, or actually removing ocean for use on other planets or artificial habitats. There wouldn't seem many scenarios for life to exist here, the place is simply too dilute. So I'd rate this as basically 0% likely to host intelligent life, let alone anything technological native to it, and quite likely to be lifeless, certainly not possessed of the rich ecosystems abundant with life the way epipelagic and even bathypelagic were. Though that's a little hard to say for certain, for no life at all, as you could get sediment built up from eruptions deep below, or space dust building up on the ice and some thermal flux. Now you might think such planets would be uncommon, but it's quite likely a large portion of super-Earths are like this, and we'll know more in the relatively near future as we keep finding more and more super-Earths among the exoplanets we've been finding, and as we get better at looking at those. So the summary. We have our overall type. Panthalastic planets, places where almost all the surface is water, with maybe polar ice and a few bits of land for special categories of archipelagic planets. We have our four other depth based subcategories epipelagic, bathypelagic, abyssopelagic, and stereopelagic. We've seen none of them except maybe the first should be particularly uncommon, and even epipelagic shouldn't be too exceptional, and that life should be a high probability on any of them except the deepest stereopelagic planets. But we've also seen the deeper they are, the harder it is for them to support lots of life, and that every one of them except the special case of archipelagic is not friendly to the development of technology, even though intelligence could develop on epipelagic and probably bathypelagic too. We also saw each was terraformable, though for stereopelagic it would be a rough time and maybe not a popular spot to live, especially since the gravity would probably be high. So that's panthalastic planets, ocean planets, and water worlds. Next week it is back to the Faster and Light series to look at wormholes, where we will discuss the theory, look at some of the problems with making them and how they could result in time travel causality loops, and also explore a lot of the overlooked uses for things if they can be made to work, like terraforming planets, or serving as power plants, or even refueling dying stars. If you want alerts when those videos come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and share it with others. Questions and comments are always welcome, and I encourage you to read those left by others and talk to them because we get some very insightful comments on these videos from the audience. If you want to help support the channel, you can find the Patreon link in the video description, and in the meantime, please try out some of the other video series on this channel. As always, thanks for watching, we'll see you next time, and have a great day.